what should you expect? Well, you should expect to not have anything. Uh, everything that you could possibly need, costumes, scenery, um, that kind of stuff, you should, you should expect to not have that and to bring that in yourself. Um, I don't know if we're still doing the 15 minute um, time for load in in between shows, but that's how it always has been done in the past. And best practices, if you can load your show in in 15 minutes or five minutes, all the better for it. And then if you can load your show out in five minutes, all the better for it. You never want to make other people late. That's one of the cardinal sins of Fringe is that you go over your time and then that knockdown event, just everyone else's day is ruined because you took 20 minutes or 30 minutes and so forth. If you need a few people to help you bring in scenery and things like that, budget that into your show, budget that time, whether it's volunteers or whatever. Um, many hands make light work. And in all honesty, if you're already producing the show that you've written and are starring in, you could use one less thing on your mind when you're going into your show. So having anyone else help you. Another thing to keep in mind is parking. Um, parking is different than it has been because Things are very chaotic. There is construction in certain areas. There's uh, different things happening here and there. It behooves you to know the basics of what parking is going to be around your venue ahead of time so that you know, well, I have to get this Chase Lounge, antique 18th century Chase Lounge that weighs approximately 300 pounds out of my Honda Accord and into this theater in 15 minutes. Where can I park so that I will not die in the process of doing this? Uh, loading zones are useful. If you have a buddy, you can roll up. They can either help you unload or take your car and move it to a safe location while you stay with the stuff while you're waiting to go in. Um, in Fringes Pass, we have waited outside the venue with our items and then loaded in as soon as we were ready. Talk with your venue about how those things work. Um, Sometimes there's enough space and places to do deals, but I'm not speaking for any venues on that. Um, talk with them and set your expectations. Plans are wonderful and contingencies are even better. Now, as for when I said you shouldn't expect anything, um, you already, I'm sure, have discussed a basic lighting package. Most places have a repertory plot or rep plot, which is here are the different areas of light. Here are the different colors of light that you can have. When we first started the Hollywood Fringe Festival, it was not entirely common to have LED lighting. And now I think over the last 10 years, the um, most of the spaces have some degree of color changing capability that doesn't necessarily involve climbing on a ladder, swapping a gel, climbing back down, finding out the light is broken, going back up, changing the lamp, going back down, realizing it's the wrong gel, going back up, changing the gel again. That all had to be a part of our 15 minute changeover when we started. A lot of, a lot of venues now have LED fixtures that have a wide variety of colors. So you can start to think about things like, I'm doing this monologue about being Poseidon, king of the ocean, and I'm thinking blue because ocean but also grain and cyan. Can we do something like that? Check with their venue and see what your options are, but it's entirely possible to have that be a part of your show. Now, at this point, I have to depart from what I would normally say because we are doing live streaming now. There are two kinds of lighting. There is lighting for screen and lighting for stage. If you are lighting for stage exclusively for live performances, what you see is what you get. So you can work in dim colors. You can explore candlelight looks. You can explore extremely low lumen backgrounds and things like that. You can be lit with a single flashlight. I've, I've designed lighting for a show where we use no conventional theater fixtures. We used lights that were operated by actors, actors lighting each other with flashlights, LEDs that would come out of people's clothing that looked like vines with um, plants wrapped around them and things like that. We used a work light that was very harsh and intentionally, like it was a, it was a dystopic 
<laughs> sort of post apocalyptic landscape. So having construction lighting kind of equipment was cool and lanterns and things like that. So it was all very intimate. That might not necessarily translate to live streaming. Now, I'm assuming that because everyone here is able to watch this, they at least have some sort of electronic device in order to watch this and participate. You can use this camera or the camera on your computer or whatever to have some experiments on your own time and, and see what sorts of lighting look like on the screen. So you can always play with those sorts of things when you're rehearsing using some piece of technology to test that. And I recommend this because going into it, you'll have a little bit more of an idea. If you want to do something really strange or really outre, avant-garde, out there, spicy is one of my favorite terms for it, then you'll want to play with this as much as you can before you go in. Whenever, when you go into tech, you want to spend the minimum amount of time getting everything laid into the script and with your stage manager operator, however your relationship is with your um, venue, so that you can hopefully run it. Now, live streaming makes it a little bit different. I said that there are two types of lighting. Now, lighting for screen, you want to make sure that you're evenly exposed. In my case, you can see, or if you cannot see, I'll explain. My hair has um, a light on it from above so that it is shining because I have chemically lightened my hair because I am vain and I like to pretend to be blonde. Now, if I move my hands, I'm currently moving my hands over my head to show that there is a top light. You can, there is a shadow moving across the top of my head. Uh, I also have a side light I'm moving my hand again, what we call flagging, to show you the shadow moving across my face. The side light gives me a gentle highlight across the screen left side of my face. And then in front of me, there is a key light, which is a diffused LED panel that I, all of these things you can buy online, but you shouldn't need to because the space will have a lighting rig set up for you. But what that's doing is the basic coverage of my face, my basic lighting. I'm trying to figure out how to show it without <laughs> covering the camera. Look, I'm incredibly dim. Um, <laughs> but that's what's doing the majority of my lighting. And then my top light is also doing a fair amount of diffuse lighting. And also, I have some lighting coming from me from a monitor that I'm referring to that I'll get to in a moment. But basically, I'm trying to give myself dimension and I'm trying to give myself even exposure so that when I stream to you, you can see my face, you can see me distinct from my background. Um, these are all the sorts of things that we've experimented with in the digital fringe world, but um, in a live setting that is being live streamed, you'll want to have some idea of what it looks like so that you are evenly exposed for live streaming. Now, if you're doing a live streaming with an audience, you will light it for the live stream and it will look like as it looks in the space, but that way you'll wanna make sure that the live stream looks good. So you'll wanna bias your lighting for that and your, your technician will work with you on that. Um, in your spaces. But if if you have any questions about that, they can help you figure that out. You should still be able to do things like blackouts. And you should still be able to do things like fades. They might look a little bit different on when you're live streaming because of how compression works for live video. It might go down in stages and things like that. So that's something to keep in mind too. Um, if you have any sort of long fades or evolutions of lighting, it might render a little bit differently artistically in live streaming than it would purely in person. So all of that, good. Um, <laughs> watch me completely lose my mind as I go through my cheat sheet. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna show you how to do a cue sheet um, 
I don't know if anyone's ever done that before, but basically here's what happens. You go through your script and you make a note of any time something happens, when you need to do a change, when you'd like to have something interesting occur, whenever something needs to shift or move or happen. Each of these is going to be a Q. And that would be spelled C-U-E, but in the, in the uh, um, live transcript, it's um, captioning it as Q-U-E-U-E, which is not correct. C-U-E as in pool Q. Um, I'm going to now show you, um, we've started with a prompt book, which you'll hand to your stage manager, which is a list of all of the cues, where they go annotated in a printed version of your script. Um, some, some venues prefer digital copies, check with your person and see what they want. But I may, I make all of my prompt books in digital exclusively. Now I know some people who prefer to work, um, printed because they like to have a pencil because then they can erase if need be and move cues around. That's very clever. And I wholeheartedly endorse it, but I'm going to share my screen now and, and walk you through an example of this. So. On the left side of the screen, there is a script. There is red lettering for where the cues go. There is black lettering for where the script is. I have denoted LX1. Now, in this case, LX will refer to lighting cues, LX for electrics, SQ for sound cues. If you are using projections, I don't necessarily and uh, encourage you to for live streaming because multimedia, especially projected, does not always render well on video. It's been the bane of my existence as a video designer that I don't have very much good footage of the work that I've done because it's notoriously difficult to, to photograph, let alone video projections. There is a way to do it, but you're going to need to book a little extra time to experiment to make sure that it looks the way you want it to. If you're doing exclusively live, then you don't really have to care about that because how it looks in the space is how it looks in the space. So great. But I also still recommend avoiding video as much as possible until you go to the next stage of your development of your piece, because while it is useful, especially for a one person person show to have, I was walking along this French Riviera, picture of French Riviera appears, to help tell your story, it winds up taking more time to slot all of that stuff in when it could be performative, when it could be danced it could be supplied by guitar that you play there it's best at this stage to play with things in a performative context and then whenever you have a moment of technical elements involved those have a lot more punch because you are in control of the scene and you can always take what happens what you learn from this experience what you learn from this show what you videoed from this show because if you're live streaming, that's great. If you're doing it just in the space, you're going to want to make sure you have photos and video taken of your piece, because if it is a success or if you'd like to keep doing it, all of that is going to be invaluable for you selling your show elsewhere. Make sure you have good video and good photos of it. There are people in the participant package that would be all too happy to work with you on that. But again, the way cell phones are now, if you have a cell phone within the last two or even three generations, you should have enough to at least take some, some footage of your, of your piece. And in fact, I would recommend taking some footage of, you, of your piece now in your rehearsal process so that you can continue to craft a trailer that you can use to promote your show that's going to be super helpful because then that will do the work for you. You can start sending it out. You can start sharing it. You can do cross promotions and handing it to other people. And then you can play their trailers. They could play yours, et cetera, et cetera. Now, going forward in the script, we begin with lights up. Now, I've already done a funky thing here because one of the first things that we forget once we've gone through all the process of checking through our show, going through all the cues, giving it a quick run through and see how it looks, 
we show up at the venue and then realize suddenly, oh no, we don't have any pre-show music. And I don't know how this show is actually supposed to start because I started at the beginning of the show and not when the audience walks in. So keep in mind, you're actually booking out from when the house is opened, what is it like for people to walk into your space? What is it like when the live stream starts? Is there some sort of background music? Is there some sort of visual thing? Do you have a group of masked performers dancing or doing a interactive mime piece that lasts for the first five minutes of audiences walking in? Sometimes you want to go a little bit longer into that opening moment just in case people are running late between things. That's not necessarily consideration for live streaming, but these are all things to keep in mind. What is the show before the show? So start with all of that, go all the way to your curtain announcement. Now, if you haven't done Fringe before, it's common for there to be a curtain announcement either at the top of show or at the end of show or both briefly introducing the piece and greeting everyone for coming. It's not necessary because some people prefer what's called a cold open. You might be familiar with this from television where things just start and you're in the middle of it. It's very exciting and people are trying to wonder, oh, what's going on? This is quite cool. Um, but sometimes people will just introduce the piece and thank everyone for coming. They will also take advantage of that opportunity to say, please take this moment to silence your cell phones. And if you're having an in-person audience, California state law requires you to make note of the emergency exits. At this point, we would like you to turn off or silence your electronic devices, all that makes sound, and please take note of the nearest emergency exit. That's all you really need to do, but also, Here's an example for more cross promotion. You can say, we'd like to invite you to check out our friend's production, My Brother's Hat. It's playing at the Zephyr on Thursdays. Uh, I think they're in here tonight. Thanks for coming. It can be that informal or it can be much more formal. Just know that there's something there to play with. And if it's at the end of the show, sometimes people will use that moment to thank people for coming and also point at other shows to go see. So you, your friendships, your fringe ships can pay off here where you're trading audiences and things like that. So the lights go down and LX1 lights up. Scene six, art. Now, sound QA, sound fade down. Now, in this case, there's been... Um, noise, audience sounds in the, this art gallery and the script happening in the background. Um, Gemma has a line and then sound QB, there is a visual with an iPod. So this is the example of a practical cue. She presses play on her iPod and music begins. Then this whole thing is a piece that she performs during the background music. So this is an example of anytime something happens Anytime something changes, that's a cue. Um, for example, LX2, she moves stage left. Now, in the world of digital streaming, making it clear if we're talking about screen, screen left or stage left is incredibly important. So I would recommend picking one depending on what your show is and sticking with it. If you are on stage, it makes, more, it makes way more sense to be thinking stage left because that would be your left as the performer on stage. If you are exclusively streaming, work it out with your technician or stage manager to process where you, how you would like to have that conversation and do it at the top because it can be very confusing if you're trying to do something based on screen direction, but you're also having to think about it on the stage dimension. And it's complete and total crisscross applesauce neural degeneration <laughs> nightmare scenario. Again, speaking as a video designer, I've had this conversation hundreds of times. And it's always hilarious when it's like, oh, move that thing left. Yeah. Now the other left. Wait, what? Wait. <laughs> so getting that out of the way early is great. So the lights have shifted as she moves, and then she has a wonderful piece. 
there's some chatting, and then she stops the music. So that's another example of something changing, and the cue to stop it is built in. Uh, rather, it is a, it is something that is performed, and we see here it is written as visual. That tells the stage manager or operator that it's going to be visually motivated. It watch the stage for the person to do this action or whatever it is. Maybe when my hand goes up, then we play some sort of magical flourish that goes with the lighting and things like that. Visual cues can affect lighting, video, sound, whatever, just as long as you make note that it's a visual cue so that the operator following along in the script can look up and say, okay, good, Boop, as soon as I do the thing. And it's always good to run that with them. And if you are so good at loading in your show that you always get it done in five minutes, it can be useful before your show to rehearse visual cues with your operator because they may be working on five, six, seven shows a day. It can be nice to check in with them at the top of the show and do a quick rehearsal of that one cue where you do the thing that makes the music start or where you do the particular thing that makes the other thing happen. I'm going to stop doing silly things with my hands because I cannot speak American Sign Language and I could be saying some ridiculous things. But it, my point is checking in with your operator is always nice. We do that on long show runs all the time where there might be a particular cue where someone has choreography with it and it's a fun way to check in with your performer as the operator to do a quick run through of it at the top of the show and be like, okay, good, we're in sync, we got this just so that the first time they do it that day isn't while people are watching. Um, and that goes for any complicated technical things, but you should keep that in mind that that's a part of your 15 minute load in. So if you do need more check-in time, if you're doing a lot of weird stuff, if you're juggling fireflies and jars and then you have to take one of them out and then there's a lightning bolt that happens, like that's all stuff you're gonna wanna run with your operator. LX3, she moves stage right. So there's another lighting shift to cover her as she walks over to that part of the stage. And then sound QD, visual, she hits play. So now we have a new track that she plays on her iPod. To help break this down, we also have what we call a cue sheet that looks like this. This has the page broken down by script page. And I tend to use the page number that is printed on the page as opposed to the page of the PDF, because in this case, our prompt book only has two pages, but it are, the pages are numbered 55 and 56. So we'll, we're always going for clarity. We're always going for whatever the most obvious references and um, points of contact are. I have this broken into lighting cues and sound cues. Lighting cues are numbered. Sound cues are lettered. You don't have to do that. I mean, I've done sound cues with letters. I've done sound cues with numbers. I've used the Greek alphabet. I've used colors. Um, the important thing is that having a distinction means that the operator knows if I'm seeing a number, then it's a lighting change. If I'm seeing a letter, then it's a sound change. And so, uh, because QLab does sound and video in most places, in some venues it runs lighting as well, we tend to lump video and sound cues in together. But if you want an additional one, you can use tab for video cues, tab TAB, tab one, tab two, or you could use any sort of other convention. If you, if you use, if you, if you <laughs> I won't go that far. Even just being able to say letters are sound and video, and um, lighting is numbers, that's enough of a distinction for basically all of the stage managers and operators to feel comfortable with. I have the moment here, which is when the thing happens. Top of scene, pretty standard. Um, she lands CS, that's for center stage. So when she gets there, then the music goes down as it says in the script. Um, visual, the rest of these are visual cues, but I have a little bit of a note here. She hits the iPad, all that kind of stuff. And then a description, what happens when this thing happens? And then the timing. 
Now a default fade. One, two, three, four, five. That's, that's a basic medium fade time. A uh, fast fade would be one. So that's like a soft blackout. Uh, a hard blackout, if you're using all LED fixtures, can be instantaneous. It can be, and that's the last time I ever saw that pizza. As opposed to, and that's the last time I ever saw that pizza. Technically, that's a wipe, but they have different flavors to them. They have different dramatic contexts to them. And knowing the ins and outs of how those things flow. And I want this to be a slow fade so that it feels like it goes on forever. Versus I want maximum drama. Ow! Keep those sorts of things in mind and have them in mind before you go into tech. It's OK to change your mind in the moment if you realize, oh, Perhaps a 35 second fade is too indulgent for this beat because I'm just sitting here waiting for the lights to go out and I feel kind of stupid. It seemed like a great idea at the time, but now that I've seen it, I want to change it. Do all that stuff in tech. Don't go to your operator or stage manager after you've done your tech and ask for a bunch of things to change because that's really not cool. <laughs> the idea is you get it all the way it's supposed to be and then you make your discoveries over the run of the show, but don't change things once you've had them in place. If you do need more time to tech it or change it in previews, check with your venue and with what, what you wanna do with that. If, if you wanna have more tech time after your preview to change things, have a word with them about that. Places can be quite accommodating for these kinds of things. I've worked on some fringe shows where we were incredibly ambitious in terms of the things that we were doing with tech. And I've also worked with some venues that were incredibly accommodating with the things that we wanted to do with tech. But by and large, that stuff should be printed and out of the way so that you can focus on the performance and then make adjustments the next time you stage it. Maybe you put it up for a week in a, in a location in North Hollywood and try some new stuff out. Maybe you decide you're gonna film it with a cell phone in the middle of a meadow over in Joshua Tree or something like that. You can do that too. Like this doesn't need to be the only time this happens, but try to make all of your choices this time and not change them too much except for in performance. There's, there's always kind of room to flow a little bit with that stuff and again, just communicate with your operator and with your venue. Sometimes they're cool with, I wanna take a longer beat at the end of this show. Can we try that tonight? And whenever possible, bring them a coffee or a tea or a water or whatever it is they like. I mean, ask them what kind of dinner they'd like or if they'd like some kind of snack or candy bar or something. That goes a long way because they have eight to 10 shows a day. <laughs> I mean, they could be working on 30 shows for the week, for the festival, whatever. If you're genuinely interested in their well-being and making sure that they have a good time, they will help you if you help them. And just don't be anyone's problem. That's all I can ask. Um, we have amazing technicians and stage managers and venue owners and, and managers and everything that are willing to help explore. The whole point of this is experimenting. And if you make it very clear that I would like to kind of adjust this thing and you always load your show in in five minutes and you're always pleasant to work with and you always come in with a smile and you're willing to work with people on anything, you're never a problem they'll probably say, yes, I'd be happy to help. So we've gone over the prompt book and we've gone over the cue sheet. Now, these two things, the cue sheet isn't necessary, but it's handy to have because then you can look at it, refer to what the next thing is. And when you're teching your show, jump down the list. So you knock everything out because ideally you want to cue to cue your show in tech pop through all the cues, 
set the look, set the thing, try it, try the whatever the thing I'm clicking the remote so the TV comes on, that kind of stuff. Build that out in a half hour, maybe an hour, because I think most um, tech times are about four hours, but venues are all different. So know what your tech period is. You want the first chunk to just cue to cue, knock it out, good to go. Because ideally, if you can do that, you will be able to run the show top to bottom with the cues. And then hopefully there's 30 minutes, 20 minutes on the back end just to go in and change a thing really quick or fix another thing really quick. It's possible to buy more tech time to rent the space for longer. That's going to be a conversation with your venue, your operator, stage manager, et cetera. If anyone is using designers, um, they can be useful in setting up a QLab file for you in advance or um, programming the show in advance. You yourself can, if you have a Mac computer, sorry, PC people, but there is an alternative. Um, you can program the sound cues of your show in advance. You down QLab is free. You just download it from figure53.com and you just drag and drop your sounds and fades and things like that. It's not impossible to learn. Not everyone is um, super interested in learning that in advance. I don't blame you. You could always find someone to program your QLab show by going um, to the participant packet or by going on the um, going to office hours or going on to the fringe website, um, rather Facebook groups, Twitter, Discord, asking, hey, would someone want to program my QLab for me? It's not that much. I'm using like three songs that I wrote when I was in college. And I'm, it's this whole thing about remembering how I wanted to be a songwriter. And then I went and became a banker. And instead, now I'm going back to become a songwriter again. I'm singing about banks, but I don't know. <laughs> if someone wants to do that show, let me know because it seems oddly compelling for some reason. I can't get off it. Um, <laughs> so prompt book, necessary. Pre-program whenever possible. For PC users, there's a, there's a piece of software called Multiplay. And I think it's being adapted. It, it had been frozen in development but now it's being adapted for, uh, by someone else. I think they picked it up and they're continuing to work with it. Um, you can use iTunes to lay things out or a variety of other playlist software. I think QLab is what everyone is using. So I, ideally it would be that. But I mean, if you have a PC and you wanna use multiplay, let me see here. <laughs> I hope this still works as a link. It doesn't work if you click on it from our document, which is hilarious. Of course, I didn't test this before I came in here, so now I look goofy. But it's a freeware software for um, PC that no longer exists. Um, I'll do some looking for that and post that in the Q&A part later, but that's if you have a PC. Honestly, I think QLab is the best way to go. And you can program it when you go in, but it, it just helps to have everything out of the way as much as possible, which is where the Q sheet can help you because they can knock that out very quickly because you just look at it and it's like, oh, okay, this thing goes here, this thing goes there. You'll wanna show up with the show on, with all of the files that you wanna play on a thumb drive that you can hand to the um, technician so that they can back up the show to the same thumb drive and then you'll make a copy of that thumb drive so that you always have one and hopefully one is always in the venue backups are good for shows it's just it just helps oh uh, pam's mentioning sound cue system for pc thank you there's also that one yeah sound cue system is i think it's free for two channels but um that one is similar to the old program SFX. You should be able to use that fairly simply. I think it's similar to a drag and drop, but it basically works the same way for Q as QLab if you have a PC. So sound cue system. Um, but in that case, you would have to bring your computer with you every time. 
And some people do that anyway. They have their show on their, their Mac laptop and they just plug it in. And it's like, here, I'd like to have my show with me just in case. But um, however you want to do that, just make sure you work with your venue and your operator, stage manager, what they, what they need and what to expect. If you are live streaming, I think there are some places that are capable of taking a video input, but if you really want to do that, make sure that they have that capability in advance. Um, if you're going to do all kinds of crazy video switching and stuff like that, super experimental stuff, um, go in, go in prepared and know what, what you're asking for. Like if you're trying to do a three camera TV studio style switching setup, ask for that. If you're trying to just present a show like um, almost every stand-up special where it's basically just dead on, I'm walking. Um, most stand-up specials have cuts in them between different camera angles, but I mean, it's it's not that difficult to be like, I'm, here's a, st a standard camera. I'm going to look at this kind of stuff. If you're doing the kind of thing where you're doing like wireless camera play, um, cutting between like the camera that you're holding, looking at yourself and stuff like that, um, that, that would, I would talk more about, um, uh, streaming technicians and, and like getting some more technology people involved. If you're just doing your show in an audience, like for an audience of people, I wouldn't worry that much about it because it's, it's just the stage and you stream it or people come and see it. But I mean, it is possible to do some very experimental things and I've done it. Um, feel free to ask me if you have a crazy idea. I promise you it's not that crazy. I will try to find a way to make it happen. It will probably take more effort, but this this is about experimenting. Um, adapters, if you are taking your show with you on your computer, you'll want to make sure that you have a headphone jack adapter, uh, a way to get the music or sounds out of your computer and into the mixing board. There is a lot about preparing a show computer You'll want to make sure that you have your charger with you, that it's not one of those computers where the battery is almost dying. I mean, you have what you have to work with. This, the venue probably has a computer that can run your show for you. So if you do have a laptop and the battery is always dying, if it's not plugged in constantly, it would behoove you to use the venue's computer. Um, um, but uh, you'll, you'll want to you'll want to be sure that it's show safe. So if you're playing your music off a phone, if you're playing your music off a computer, turn off the lock screen, turn off the password protection, turn off the screen saver. Um, there's a whole a computer prepares segment of the figure 53 page, um, which is where QLab is that you'll want to check it tells you how to prepare your laptop uh it, it does things like turn off certain thing and it walks you through it and that's all on their page if you're using qlab if you're using a pc i think many of the same things apply turn off your screensaver probably turn off your wi-fi so you don't get notifications that ding while you're trying to do show because it, it can be quite distracting if suddenly you get an email mid-show and it's like hey like, these are the kinds of things to keep in mind. Um, there are a variety of places to get music that are royalty free. Um, because live streaming has content management involved in certain venues, uh, rather platforms, YouTube will sniff for copywritten music. Uh, I think Twitch sniffs for copywritten music. Um, there are algorithms that detect music that belongs to other people and will either claim your uh, video for copyright or strike you for it. Uh, and sometimes it'll change the audio completely if, uh, if they decide you don't have the rights to use it. 
generally speaking, it's best to stay away from it and just use royalty free music, music that you have made yourself or music that you have had a composer make for you. Um, but I just, I tell people that as much as possible, just generally avoid um, using music that doesn't belong to you. If you're, if you're in person only, you can probably get away with it, but it's so much better if you can bring your own music, your own stuff for your show. If you, if you bring that all to the table as your piece, or if you have a composer, if you have a musician that you can work with, a lot of smaller bands love having their music heard by people and reaching out to them. It can be a great way to pull things together. Um, video. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just check if someone else um, has a video question as we get there, because it's all kind of bespoke and every single case is different. So I kind of don't want to mess with that. <clears throat> um, last couple things, and I'm going to bring Pam in. Um, have someone on a clock the whole time. Set timers. You don't have to be the one in charge of the clock. Clocks are smart enough to be in charge of themselves. But if you start going over time on your tech day, buckle down and get back on schedule. You want to get everything out of the way as quickly as possible. Don't spend time discussing choices or acting things unless it's specifically keyed to placement of objects in the space and their dynamics because tech time goes very quickly and you just you don't want to get stuck in that situation where you almost finished. Um, take care of all of your biological considerations before your tech time begins. You don't want to have to lose time because your performers suddenly need a bathroom break and you've been there for five minutes and now you have to wait another 10 minutes while your whole cast goes and prepares themselves for the show. Make it clear on your ensemble to get their needs settled before you begin your process. Um, if it is a one person show, it's, it's a lot easier to get yourself to do that, but I recommend having someone else help you with the load in so that you can step aside, take care of your business and then begin. For one person shows, it's always going to be nice to have a couple extra people on your team because that's one more person to help with marketing. That's one more person to help with how you look on stage. You can ideally trust them to watch you move around and help you. I, I, you probably have a director, I would assume. If you don't, good for you, but maybe get a friend in so that can help you move costumes and, and, and scenery and so forth around. Um, Tech is not a time for creative changes. If a piece of blocking or a directorial choice doesn't work, make a note and fix it in an outside rehearsal space unless it's tech dependent. Um, if you have a general, what we call stage wash, lighting everywhere, I can kind of go wherever. That's probably gonna be who most people doing a live stream show because you know the whole stage is lit and you can kind of go wherever and you're all right. But you don't want to get stuck in a situation where you're having a deep conversation with your director about performance notes, about the, the peculiarities and the, 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 very, the granular nature of, of performative stuff. You might not even have it all figured out yet, but you at least know, well, this part of the stage is where I'm going to be because the chair is there and the whole thing is about me sitting in my grandmother's chair this is a piece, my grandmother's chair. So it's, it's going to be the chair. Like I know that much, but am I going to be standing behind it? I'm going to be sitting on it. Is it, am I, am I kneeling next to it? These, these are the kinds of things that are, while they are tech dependent, if you just know, have the area lit so I can do whatever, you can experiment with it over the course of the festival and your performances. Like maybe you do one where you're kneeling next to it. Maybe you do one where you're standing behind it. Maybe you do one where you walk into the audience and look at it and talk to the audience while you're looking at it. I don't know. But those are the kinds of things like 
you don't want to lose tech time and possibly not be able to get through your show just because you can't figure out what the core of your show is. Do that elsewhere. Ideally before tech, but we all make discoveries and sometimes things need to change. That's, that's, that's fine, but don't make that a discovery that you make in the place. You will likely be insanely stressed. This is uncomfortable. You may not be used to this experience. If you have to step into the booth or the box office or outside, count to 10, take three deep breaths and calm down. You can also count to five. There's the PTSD strategy where you work through five different senses. And I can't remember exactly what they are, but it's something like five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can smell, one thing you can taste, and I forgot two things you can touch, like sense, I believe. You work your way down and ground yourself in the situation. There are many other strategies than that. Uh, look up de-stressing strategies, begin meditating now to get a baseline. I live with this background radiation of my life because I've been in production for 17 years, but if this is your first time doing this, this could possibly be the worst day of your life if you don't know going in that there's a lot of stuff that has to happen very quickly and all needs to get done that day. And oh goodness, if we don't get it done, we're, we're in terrible trouble know that going in and here's a good thing picture yourself as a cheerleader not a dictator believe in people put your faith in your technician your stage manager your helpers your designers your cast give yourself to the moment and don't stress there's a thing called analysis paralysis where we find ourselves continually considering the same thing over and over again and we can't make decisions it's possible to just make arbitrary decisions and move on. Sometimes just making a choice, whatever it needs to be, like, I can't decide if it should be red or blue. Um, blue. It's blue. Go. Like, if you want to roll a die, if you want to flip a coin, that's just as valid as having the most complicated thought about something. The most dramaturgically accurate 17th century garment that you have to wear for my grandmother's chair because obviously it's set in the 17th century because you're actually in the 18th century ah the twist it's going to be a great show for friends 2020 a uh, couple more tips be sober completely utterly sober seriously whatever you prefer to indulge in can happen after your tech but right now, you need everyone to be clear-headed and as present as possible. And that is not too much to ask for the entire team. Go in with as little chemical alterations as are medically possible for everyone. I understand there are accommodations that occasionally need to be made for pain management and things like this. But all of these things should be known knowns going in. And everyone should be as clear-headed and ready to work as possible because it's a maximum amount of effort for a minimum amount of time. It's silly that we do things that way in theater generally, but to have 15 people working together to make a thing happen, it just helps to get it done as quickly as possible. Otherwise, you can spend weeks working on a thing, which they do in Europe, but it doesn't really work as well for French festivals when you have 20 shows teching in a day. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's 20, probably more like eight, but still. Um, it helps to find out what snacks your crew likes and provide them. Um, bringing water and things like that is good. Uh, having things like hand sanitizer and masks in our COVID time thing, that's a new one for us, but that's also something that we've done, like just have a pack of masks and some hand sanitizer, asking people to stay masked when they're not on stage. Uh, asking people to stay masked when they're not in scene. These are all things that people sometimes that, that you can do. Um, I'm going to leave it to all of you to, to figure out your best, pa uh, best practices for those things. But um, <laughs> the generally speaking, SAG after you stay masked when you're not on, not on screen and when you're not filming. So during tech, people might stay masked. 
and then when you start the scene take it off like it's better to be safe than sorry and it's better to be mildly uncomfortable now than terribly uncomfortable later so know your limitations and understand your exposure uh leave the space the space cleaner than you've found it if you're planning on using confetti don't baby powder don't water try not to um bring your own equipment to clean whatever the thing is don't assume that there's a mop occurring in the space if you're going to do some water thing have three towels one main towel a spare towel and then an understudy for the spare towel so that you can clean whatever needs to happen after that don't use glitter glitter is evil glitter is hateful you will be excommunicated and sent to the land of wind and ghosts if you bring glitter into a space and introduce it into the festival it is a terrible and heinous thing it is cruel and awful um a standard rule no one is allowed to leave tech for any reason it's a few hours it's your job to power through and get out if you finish early great you want to finish early you want to not use all your time you want to get done run it feel good about it and get out of there it's a present to everyone to get done early um think about the bigger picture Design is an important way to enhance your production, but big design does not a fringe show make nor break. Trust your work. Let your story tell itself. Tech only what you need. You can add fancy design when you transfer to a bigger theater or to another space, or if you get picked up by Netflix or whatever. Focus on the performative here and then build out later and keep in mind what sorts of things you'd like to add i've seen if you haven't seen bo burnham's inside yet like that's about the most you can possibly do it's on netflix that's the most you can possibly do for a live streaming piece no one in the festival is going to do that so let's call that the high water mark of extra the, uh, the, 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 the snowy peak of Extra Mountain. And take a look at what he does in that that is effective and shamelessly steal for your own purposes. There are things where he lights himself with his own cell phone. There are things where he plays music and uses loops and plays with it. There is parts where he's lit with a projector. That might not look great if I'm trying to project an image of the French Riviera as I begin to talk about the French Riviera. But if I'm using a tree texture, this happens at the end. It's not a spoiler, it's just pretty. He's projected on himself with birch trees in sort of a forest thing. And it, the way it hits his face is very interesting. So breakup patterns, that's what we call it when it's textured lighting. Typically, we did that with gobos, which are little pieces of metal with holes in it that make cool patterns when you shine a light through it, which is dope. Um, you can do that with projectors, too. And sometimes just having a swirly thing happening on your face while you're doing the this. I don't, I don't know what this is, but it's compelling, or it would be if I had a projector on me. So keep that in mind. Um, and that could be just... That could be the climactic moment. You could save tech in your show until the climactic moment when you have died and returned from the dead, realizing that death is nothing but an infinite cycle of rebirth. And in fact, you're only living the same life constantly over and over again. Sorry, if I spoiled whoever's show if that was something you were already doing, but you can make that moment of catharsis the big technical moment and then the rest of it is just a person in a space navigating the story this is perfectly valid and, and in fact i've seen a lot of fringe shows where they save it all for the big guns moment where it all explodes and it's a big thing and then the lights go out and then it comes on and everyone's like i didn't even see that coming i've also seen some very effective things where actors build the space and actors are foley and actors are lighting and the whole thing is about this team 
runs in, sets everything up in five minutes, then goes outside and starts entertaining people as the pre-show. Steal, by all means, steal lovingly these ideas and <laughs> explore them. If you're a one-person show, team up with a busker. Find someone who's playing guitar. Have someone playing on stage for your pre-show. Do interesting stuff. People have not seen live work in 16 months, 20 months, a year and a half. Give them something they weren't expecting. And it can be as simple as a dude with a puka shell necklace and no shirt and for some reason suede shorts with a guitar and beach hair and it's this whole mood thing and then you walk in and begin Venice California 1987 man those were the days you see what I'm saying here it doesn't take much but it's so much more interesting to do something that you're not really expecting even better if he's got actually later hosen and uh, um, squeeze box but I mean you find them you can find them uh, my last thing Remember why you're doing what you're doing. You're a part of the largest arts festival in the Western United States. Fringe is beautiful. Fringe is fun. Fringe is intimate. Fringe is brave. If you're not having fun, then you're not doing it right. Theater problems are happy problems. And even in the world of live streaming, when we are comparing ourselves to the Parks and Rec reunion that was filmed entirely socially distanced, the 30 Rock socially distanced filmed reunion, Bo Burnham's Inside, um, pieces that have been developed all across the world that go out of their way to experiment with heavy video integration and big stacks of whirring machines that continue to throw video in all sorts of cool ways, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, you are just telling your truth. You're sharing your story. Be brave enough to give that to us as intimately as possible. And don't let the apparatus interfere with your truth. Only let it enhance it. I'd like to turn it over to Pat to talk about the live streamy stuff. Awesome, Corwin, as usual. Hello, I am Pam Knowles. My pronouns are she, her. I have, for visual description, I have medium length dreadlocks, big round silver glasses. I'm a black woman and I'm sitting in front of a spaceship the interior of the only decent TARDIS that they have had since the reboot. So we're gonna have an amazing fringe. And all you have to remember, many things you have to remember, but your biggest one when you're dealing with your, your tech person in your venue, they will not let you fall. They're not there to make you look bad. They're there to help you achieve whatever it is you're off, off to do. Now, there are some technical things you will need. For example, Let's say, um, as he was talking about earlier, if you're in a venue that does not have a dedicated computer to run QLab, to run sound, to run lights, to run video, um, and if you're bringing in your own, you're going to need an HDMI adapter if you have a mic, if you have a Mac. This will connect your Mac, usually through its Thunderbolt, to the projector or to the monitor depending on whatever you're using in that venue. Um, a, a lot of times we forget to tell people just a little bitty practical things you're gonna need. That's a huge one. And they are very cheap actually. You don't wanna get the super cheap ones because you get what you pay for, but you can get um, a, a decent one for 25 bucks off of Amazon or Best Buy or any place like that. It's an HDMI adapter. It goes from your Thunderbolt to the little pin things. So if you're gonna bring your own, this is my emotional support, like QLab and has come with me all the time, then you're gonna to have to provide your stuff for your venue as well. Um, as they were saying about the LEDs, a lot of venues, and this is actually just wonderful, they're coming in with new stuff, the new, new to us lighting, not the stone age lighting and everything. 
this also kind of means you might not necessarily have your, I want my dedicated spotlight here. You can have your cool here, your warm here, your general, but don't get too tied up or don't get upset if you're not gonna have a fired on um, spotlight. There's another way they can come up with it and do it. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have been live stream, which is the new and exciting thing. And in fact, I'm gonna bet if any of you have been on Zoom calls, Zoom shows, StreamYard stuff, uh, what's the other big one? Crowdcast, Facebook Live, you have already been streaming. Streaming is not just the big, huge OBS. It's not just the, I need a whole big studio and everything. It's a couple of cameras. It's actually your, your camera phone. It's your iPad phone. It's your webcam. You export it out to be watched either in the room, in YouTube, in um, Facebook Live, you are streaming. I don't know how many of you are going to do that for this fringe. And maybe I should, I can, I can go some big, big picture stuff or I can just wait for the questions. But um, one thing to really keep in mind that you can take advantage of, that you can use to your advantage are the power of your virtual backgrounds. All your actors, no matter where they are, we're all in the spaceship. It's 1950, like in a library. Everybody gets the same image. You just train them how, here's turn it on, turn it off. Make sure your sound and image, this, your sound system as well, patch it through so it looks like everybody's in the same courtroom. You, everybody hears the same sound. Everybody has the same background on. You don't have to just do the, I'm sitting in my living room and hopefully the power of my acting, they'll think that I'm in a spaceship in 1953. You can actually help the power of your acting. Just get over that bump a little bit. Just think of the little bitty details that aren't that hard to do. And people are used to it by now. You're probably also worried about your internet connection. One thing that we all say, tech is gonna tech. Even more so now in this, what is happening to us time. Tech is gonna tech, it's out of your hands. I've had tech go out in live shows uh, during fringes and other times. <laughs> I had one um, in the before times, it, this, this masher thing that eats people and she had to close the door and the remote control light that I, I controlled from 15 feet away, she closed the door and the light fell off the door and landed right in front of the audience. And thank God, because fringe people are awesome. Some girl sitting on the second row, she looks up, she looks back, she runs up, she picks it up, she stuck it back on the door and she ran back to her seat. I bought her a drink that night. So tech's gonna tech, all right? <laughs> you know, something practical or something online. It's okay. Go ahead and panic. Hope the, the tech text during your tech. So you know, oh, that's gonna happen. Let's panic and figure it out now. But if it happens during your show, or you get frozen, or you get the spinning beach ball of death. Be ye not afraid. Your tech person is screaming to themselves in the booth, trying to fix it for you. It'll, it'll be fixed. Just keep going. No matter what happens, just keep going. Because half the time the audience thinks it's part of the show. They don't know. You can play with it, use your improv stuff. Um, there are so many different ways to live stream. Uh, and so many different levels of it. And I know he just dropped uh, a few more resources in. I feel like, Ellen, Corwin, what do you think? Should I, should, should we go with questions or should I go big picture? I don't wanna waste their time. You know what I mean? Yeah, why don't we do like, if you wanna give a couple best practices and then questions would be great too. Um, but it's really up to you at this moment. We'll have, we have 40 minutes, so. Sweet. The we'll have enough time. Live streaming, your lighting, your lighting is number one. Your lighting is more important than anything else. And you think of it as a triangle, your main light right in front of you, right? Then one, you're the apex of the triangle. Then one kind of like on the side to give you a little bit of shadowing, a little bit like that. And then one kind of like, oh, I suck at math, isosceles, kind of like three quarters of the way there and up elevated a little bit. Uh, who knew that math would you'd have to use it? I, I had no idea. Elevate it a little bit. Your lighting is everything. Life even more important 
that we know that light, uh, lighting is a big deal live stage, but on streaming, it is absolutely everything. You will look washed out, you will look dead. It's the difference between looking red or looking my natural color. Uh, there are some live streams I've been in the wrong lighting and I don't look like this. I look like what Marcus looks like. That's Marcus's color, but it was bad lighting. So my brown cell looked like his red cell. And God forbid, poor white people with the wrong lighting, you'll just look like ghosts. You look like ghosts or you look like you're on fire and it's a terrible thing. Lighting is the biggest thing. And it can be done cheaply and it can be done easily. Uh, and to your, oh, for your backgrounds, a lot of you are gonna be in uh, theaters doing your live streams. So you're gonna use their space. But for those of you who aren't and you're gonna be doing live streaming from your home, you don't have to have a green screen. Green screen is useful, but if you have a bright room, a little bit of natural light if you can, but if you're doing it in the evening, it doesn't matter, just bright lighting, a solid color wall, a light color wall, white, off-white, dove gray, and nothing else on that wall. No pictures, no like shelves and stuff like that. You can use, you can do solid virtual backgrounds that way without a green screen. I just have a green screen because me and my geek friends, we like to show off our, our, our spaceships. I win, um, but you don't have to have that. Those are my two big things. Yeah, I think it would be great to open it up to questions. And I also think it would be awesome if we could um, address the question in the chat for those that were on Facebook, which was about, um, using um my my show is an ensemble oh actually Layla, you can unmute and ask the question yourself if you would like so you can pitch your show really quick thank you so much ellen and and corwin and pam for doing this uh, i am Layla. i am the writer and producer for tribe uh, my director Mish is actually in here but tribe is the story of the first all arab improv team we call it a shawarma spin on a pitch perfect type comedy ensemble and it has set scenes that I wrote in theater and it also has live improv. So it is the hybrid of the hybrid festival. <laughs> and my question that I dropped in the chat and Corin got a chance to address this a little for me was my show is an ensemble comedy that is live streaming the live performances at the Broadwater Black Box. Do I need to have additional audio rented for my actors? A laugh for each actor adds up, and I am interested in sound solutions and tips. And um, I, I answered in the chat, but it's always good to have labs for each performer for a streaming production. Um, you just get the cleanest audio, but that said, um, if people like hit the live hit the mic then you get that noise so it turns into a whole thing I mean if you're doing a musical I'd probably say yeah go for it but honestly improv I think you're okay with whatever area miking they use um it'd be some projection like uh you would in a live improv show but it, it almost behooves you to not be um stuck with the problem of having to deal with technology so that you can have the the life of the improv show there and I have a feeling that you don't have a problem being too quiet because you're probably hilarious as a group and function as this well tribe I guess I mean so it seems to me like you're you're trying to do a high energy show you're not going to have a problem with the audio on that and then if you really feel like you need it to do a high quality taping or something like that you could go there and then it's just one thing but just like anything else the more tech you add the more potential issues you add to it um a lot of people this is how i've filmed a lot of the work that i've done during quarantine there's a $20 Movo um, lavalier, and this is for the live streaming people, but it, you just clip it in, it's a USB, or you can plug it into an interface, and then I have people use either earbuds, because you can hide them with hair, um, whether it's um, uh, wired or Bluetooth, and then that's how you can 
kind of monitor what's happening. Other actors, you listen in the earbud and then you talk with the Movo. I'll put a link to it in a moment. But if you're doing hybrid and you're on stage, I wouldn't really worry about it that much. And the reason I answered so in depth is because other people might be thinking, oh, well, what if I do that too? No, absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Corin. And I don't know, Pam, if you had any other thoughts. That is the perfect answer. And you'll be safe at, at the Broadwater. Their, their spaces are so very well insulated, uh, sound insulated and tight. So if you've got an a, a improv group there, and as you said, loud, you'll be able to fill the space and be able to be heard on your recording system there. Yeah, it's a good place. Not very echoey there. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful to hear it because uh, as it was pointed out, extra elements means uh, extra troubleshooting. So I love to keep it simple. So thank you. Uh, Go ahead, Sin. I have Sin up next. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm having to hire. I'm in Brooklyn, everybody on the West Coast. Or, uh, every, I mean, saying hi to you on the West Coast. I'm in Brooklyn. I have to hire a live streamer to do tech. Um, it's basically going to be out of my living room or someone's living room who has stable Wi Fi. So it's really simple. Um, but I still have to pay them and I'm finding people still want to charge me like more than all of you are paying at a real theater. So I want to know prices ranges. I mean, I think it was Layla who told me that she was paying $45 an hour at the Broadway at the Broadwater for her tech person. So, you know, people here are asking for 150 an hour and it's just me little old me all by myself um with a living room so i'm just trying to get a realistic range because even between la and new york it shouldn't be that much of a disparity is what i'm thinking think of it for, this oh oh just one second oh. as for fringe perspective i just want to say for you know so we don't get into any legal troubles here or anything like that let's talk in ranges and not exact numbers necessarily just because it's always better to do um, things that way okay Thank you, Ellen. Great. Uh, just generally speaking, I would think of it this way. The rates you're seeing being charged, the ranges in fringe, at least here, these are not our real rates. These are our fringe rates. Mm -hmm. Some of the rates that you were talking about, because we are also independent uh, creators or we want to support independent creators. Mm -hmm. And we know that this is expensive. So we are all taking a hit and reducing our rates greatly for this. To me, the idea of 150 or so, that's not unusual. They're here or wherever because these are skills that cost. These are skills that cost to learn. This is the time. It's all of that stuff. So I don't know what, I guess you keep hunting or look at the fringe participant pack. Isn't there a, Corman, isn't there a fringe participant pack with a list of locals who are- For New York City, for New York City. That's it's online, really, so it part. doesn't really matter. That, that's the tricky part though. Um, you're coming from a completely different market yeah. and physically the people working for Hollywood Fringe are located in California. Um, right. in that's what I mean. Area, yeah. So you've got, a, you've got a, an unusual pickle here. Um, I don't know if anyone else is coming in from a different location. Um, but also similarly, if you're coming from say Simi Valley or um, San Diego or even right. Sacramento or Colorado, Idaho, Adelaide, London, whatever. Generally speaking, Wi-Fi is the worst possible way to live stream and no one should ever do it if there's any other possible way to get away from it. Wi-Fi is the most unstable and you will almost certainly have drops if not because of fluctuations in the signal, then the relative humidity of the room or the reflectivity of a metal garment can interrupt the Wi-Fi signal, um, an errant electrical signal from your headphones. <laughs> like it's, it's, those are very high frequencies and a lot of things can disrupt it. Someone running a microwave next door might knock you off. I mean, Me once. it shouldn't, but sometimes, <laughs> it dips yeah. anyway um so generally speaking what you you might be better off experimenting with 
using a Zoom platform for your show so that you have the most amount of control over it and streaming that way so that you aren't relying on a streamer. Um, it's difficult for us because we don't have the infrastructure to support n New York broadcasters at Fringe because we just did this for the first time this year, except for Fringe at Home stuff. So I, I think you're probably better off removing that from the picture and going for a more low tech aesthetic using the zoom as a part of it and um if at all possible plugging directly into your router with a ethernet cable i'll do a little um look see here and show you the things that you might need and i think you already emailed me so i'll follow up with you in a little bit more specific terms I, 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 I want to accommodate you because it's really, really cool to me to have people from elsewhere working as a part of the festival. Yeah. And in my aspiration, I've been trying to get people to live stream in LA for five to eight years. And the fact that suddenly we're doing it makes me giddy. So I want to try and make that work for you. So I'll, I'll follow up with you over email and try to work out your specifics. But what I'm going to probably say is... Um, Ethernet cable into the back of your router so you have a dedicated line. I'm coming at you now from a dedicated line out of my laptop. I am in no way using Wi-Fi. Um, I also have a USB to, wi uh, to Ethernet connector. And I do that because most of the computers that you get now either have a USB-C Thunderbolt port or just don't have an Ethernet adapter on them. And pretty much if you're if you're live streaming from home, you've got to be hardline. You've got to be wired in. It's just the best way to go straight to your router or to your um, modem. However, if you have cable, if you have fiber, if you have whatever kind of internet access, make sure it's on a cable because the your signal is going to be that much more robust. Um, and then apart from that, I'm just going to tell you some other things about how to use Zoom, how to use... Um, things like that. So if anyone has any similar questions to that, just let me know, but definitely hardline internet. I also want to mention that um, some of our people in our participant packet had offered out that they will do um, virtual consultations and be able to do that. So if you do want to hire from the community, there is that possibility. It is, you know, at Hollywood Fringe, we're still learning, like Corwin said, um, how to support people from other places when you're not here physically. So a super different challenge than we've had before. Um, usually it's like, oh, well, when we get here, we'll be able to work on this. But it's different now. But um, there will be a chance um, to talk to people that way if you do want to um, go through that. And yeah, I would just say that that would be a great way to hire somebody in. I see another question from Diana. So I'm going to put Diana here. And I, I, I apologize that this is something brought up that it came from another event and I'm late. Um, you, because I'm totally that, I'm totally that dreaming from, um, the Rainbow Theater LGBT Center. Um, do you recommend, are there better platforms? Because I do need to have a platform to live stream from. Do you recommend what are some of the better platforms to get or to look up to? Do you have a, a recommendation? Do you intend to do audience interaction? I'm sorry, what? Do you intend to work with your audience? Uh, like um, I, I, the Rainbow Good Night is our in-person audience, so I'll be totally live streaming. Um, but, but, because of the medical, yeah, I'm totally about to be with other audience. Well, uh, my question is, would you like to have a conversation with your audience or are you simply presenting to them as a show? Um, like, I, I, I would like to, I planned on when I was going to have the audience during the talk back afterward. I'm trying to, and I had booked for that specific time. Now that I know I can't have it in person, audience I'm just trying to see if that's um a possibility to because I was that has been the plan um I need to rethink that a little bit and how could I do that and transition smoothly from 
because now the audience will all be, you know, virtual too. So if you have any suggestions, because I still would like to have um, a talk back if I can. So Twitch is good for that. Uh -huh. It's wonderful for live presentation, live streaming with audience um, interaction right there, right with you. Okay. You might need somebody to monitor the room for you. You know, if you're, well, you're, you're performing in between. StreamYard is kind of okay like that. Um, obviously YouTube um, live. And again, you need somebody to monitor the room, to bring questions, to bring interaction, to bring in. But, Twitch and, and, you know, and Zoom, that's one of the things Zoom does, but it's good for talk back. But for during show interaction, Twitch is amazing for that. It's a great right. platform. Okay, yeah, the, I mean, there's no quote unquote interaction during the performance, but there is, if I do the talk back, but I like there would be a Q and A um, afterward. And that, like I said, when I was going to have an in-person audience, that was my plan, but that um, that has been changed. I did decide not to change the venue because it was um, more complicated. So cool. Well, so thank you. And I may reach out um, just for more advice, but thank you very much. You got this. I just wanted to also add that the platforms that Fringe uses because of um, it's pretty easy. We looked into using Vimeo for the talkback portions, or you can also use Zoom um, presentations, which is like more like there's literal questions asked, but both of those cost money. So there yeah. are also paid options. So we started using YouTube Live for that reason, for some of those interactive ones. So that's also yeah. an option. And you can have it be unlisted if you want it to be more private too, if you don't want it to be public. Yes, I went to Vimeo and Vimeo Live with 75 a month with a year for subscription. No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> no, no, no. Only if my fairy godmother gives me money will that happen. And I don't know where he or she is, so I don't, I don't think that happened. <laughs> you um, seem to gather for the first time when you got, I loved that. That was so I, cool. Oh, I had no idea. I thought I was going to be stuck in there forever, but it was really fun. I thought I, I won't do my show of me trying to get out of gather a month later, but it was fun. I can see a show being done there in, in your active talk back. Oh my gosh, that, that's a lot of, and possibly, you know, immersive, the big thing now. That's a lot of potential there. Yeah, that, um, that is a thought to have a um, meet me in the bar at Fringe Central at so and so time so we can have a talk back and then you're making use of Fringe Central and you can just say I'll be at this particular table and then take a screen cap of it and show it to your audience at the end of the show or, or email it to them after or something like that. Um, I also there's a discord if um, you want to go that way. I know I'm, I'm trying to suggest right. things that have different um, levels of accessibility as well, because right. Discord is basically a chat room, but it also has a video chat room. And yeah. then um, Gather also has chat that you can have, but it's person to person and also nearby chat. It's so um, if there are people who prefer discussing things in text only, I personally am way more interested in text-based communication because I'm faster with that than I am in anything else. But um, I mean, all of those things. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would recommend Gather. I, I believe if the, we're going to be open at regular times throughout the festival. So you, you should be able to work something out with that. Our times will be announced on Friday. So if you're looking for what times the Fringe Central will be open, we'll be dropping an audience packet on Friday. Yeah. I'm also looking to have live captioning to best believe. I'm on the, I have sign language interpreting, but I'm hoping to have audio on live, audio description on live um, captioning as well. So I'm looking for platforms that I can also do that on. But thank you so much, you guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Deborah, would you like to ask your question? Oh, Deborah. 
Hello, here I am. Hello. Okay. Um, I am. I hate tech. Sorry about that. You've made it uh, much easier, but nevertheless, I'm going to shoot myself, and that's the major reason that I have not put on a show because uh, I, it frightens that you know what out of me. Anyway, my question was this: You were mentioning music, and that you should not use music that was, uh, you know, copyrighted. Now. I don't need much tech for my show, but I want you to do a, a song that was well known as an introduction, one that was well known where I do a dance and one where I end the show. Now that means I can't do any of those, or even if I had somebody on stage that was playing those, that would even be a copyright infringement. So I couldn't have my songs that I want. If you have someone playing it, it's a little bit different. And if you have someone, if you're performing it live and it's sort of a parody of it, that you've, you've changed the lyrics for yourself, then it's a little bit different. Um, when you make a recording of the piece, uh, there's all sorts of rights and things that go into it. And one of the perils of being exposed to the internet means that your chances of being seen and mm -hmm. caught for using someone else's intellectual property uh, th this goes for if you wanted to use clips of a TV show, if you wanted to use clips of movies, if you wanted to do, uh, if you wanted to use people's artwork that you didn't have the copyright for, all of these things kind of go into it. Um, will you necessarily be caught? No, especially if you are in person. Is that the right thing to do? Well, it isn't. I don't want to do anything illegal. That's what I'm trying to say. I want to stick. I want to be kosher. But I also love those songs that I was going to use. I had my heart set on them. And I know I can't sing them. You know. Well, there are some places online, and there's a guy in particular who has been doing royalty-free music. He's a movie composer. He does more royalty-free music in the vein of whatever it is you're trying to replicate. So we can drop his um, his website into the chat if I can find it, or I'll send it to Ellen to send out into the packet. Okay. And it's not just, and he's right, it's not, you know, they have web crawlers going on finding things. And it's not just the people who don't own the rights, the people who actually make the songs. A few, a few months ago, Metallica, do you remember that? Metallica was performing at the big Twitch concert. They were performing their own music. And because of Twitch had just changed the Dogma rules uh, and Metallica technically didn't have ownership of that broadcast version of what they were doing, their own song got replaced by, well, what did they use, Chipmunks? It they was like stuff. elevator music. It's it was so ridiculous. weird because they're like thrashing and it's all like. Yeah, oh. yeah. Okay. But you know, it is a gray area. As soon as you go out online, I mean, you're, you're exposed, right? But it's a gray area. We have all been in theaters and in person, nobody, where they're playing preview music, where you're like, yeah, that sounds like Prince. I bet, yeah, that's, you're probably not, but no, I'm not going to tell, you know, or they're singing a, a World War II song or something. So it's a morally gray area where you won't get caught in person. Oh, whoops. I accidentally replaced my spotlight. Technical issue there, y'all. Sorry about that. <laughs> I just wanted to add that we are not lawyers and we want to um, really make sure that people know that any of these things should be taken with a grain of salt. So anything where you're going into a legal issue, whether it's equity, whether it's AB5, whether it's streaming, these are things that if you have a really deep concern about, you should definitely just either avoid um, any altercation with that law or um, talk with a lawyer about um, that being said there like like Pam has said like um, Corwin has said there are tons of royalty free music options for pre-show music post-show music any of these types of things and I and, and I would encourage um, you guys we can drop some of those in the chat I can drop what we used for our um, pre-show music for this event itself which we do for every event uh, and I think that that's just going to be the safest way to go with anything live stream because there have been streams that have been taken down and you can get your account disabled, which doesn't necessarily mean that you can't make another account. But what a what a terrible thing to happen in the middle of your fringe run and the last yeah. thing that you need on your shoulders. So I just yeah. want to say that from a fringe perspective. Well, and another thing from a YouTuber perspective, um, I watch a lot of YouTube and I know a lot of uh 
a lot of YouTube content creators process pop culture stuff, whether they're <laughs> streaming gaming, whether they're talking about the most recent episode of Loki on Disney Plus, and they'll show clips of stuff. There, there is fair use and there is, if you're using it to um, criticize a thing, uh, if you're using it to do, uh, hello, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, we can hear you. <laughs> uh, if you're if you're using um, these things to uh, comment on the piece and look into fair use, it's a little bit more complicated than that. If you just want to do a refrain of it, and the person is playing a few chords, that might be a distinct enough thing as well. And because there, there are um, sort of a musical tradition of leitmotifs and calling out to other songs when you're playing them um, thematically. So there may be a way to incorporate that and call to it and speak to it, especially if it's dramaturgically important to your piece. Like my parents fell in love listening to some Enchanted Evening and I, I, I have to have just a little bit of it leak in. Well, how can I do that where it's distinct, but it calls to it, but it isn't it, but it suggests it, that kind of thing. Yeah. So there's a deft way to kind of navigate that. Yeah. But you can also, t you can also go on the Fringe site, um, Facebook, Discord, whatever, and ask a composer, hey, um, could you help me do something that's like this, but I want to do a song that's evocative of this but is also tied to my piece and yes if you use karaoke versions that will count because typically the karaoke versions are also being sniffed out by no. the automatic content id bots so they'll be sniffing for the track and even if you're singing on it they can pick it up i, I did a facebook live when i was experimenting in may of 2020 and it did knock out one of the karaoke tracks I was playing with, and it was just silent for that portion. Yes. I didn't get a content hit, but it was like, no. <laughs> it hit on YouTube and a Twitch one, yeah. It's, and what's interesting is all, all the bots are pulling so that the people who have the paperwork, basically, not the, not the creators, not the, not the actual creators, but the, uh, the ones who own the, 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 the book, the ones who own the, the, I don't know musical terms. You know what I'm talking about. All yeah. The things, yeah. yeah. So I had one, important. I had one that was fair use in, that was public domain in the U.S., but it was, oh, the copyright was owned in Brazil and mm. they, they flagged it for that. I was like, what, what is this? So like, if you can make your own music, it just helps. I mean, it, it didn't, it wasn't a strike because there's on YouTube, there's a copyright strike and then there's a copyright claim. If they strike you, you get three and they shut down your channel. If they claim you, then they just take your advertising revenue, which like, I don't really care. And it, that, that leads into a whole further discussion about where copyright is heading and things like that. But sound effects can, uh, technically anything is copywritten, but you can have um, royalty free sound effects. There are libraries for that online too. Hey, Corwin, where do you think people could find all of these sound um, information? Do you think maybe inside our participant packet? Yes, in Whoa! fact, I, co I copy pasted from the packet that I used to give out for this very presentation and put that in a participant packet this year. I highly recommend if you have any um, questions, so make sure that you look through that amazing resource because there are so many um, great things to be able to there's discounts in the participant packet. There's all of these information, like where do I find this? Where do I find that? Where do I find the logo? Where do I find things? And it's broken down into different categories. So if you wanna go specifically to tech stuff, there's a whole tech category that I would really um, encourage everybody to look at. And I know that um, it's just a great resource for everyone. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. And I was wondering, Eric, I see that your hand is up. And if anybody else has a question, can they please um, make sure that they uh, drop in the chat or raise their hand so that we can get to you. Go ahead, Eric. 
Oh, uh, thanks. I have two questions, then I have a comment about the music if there's time. But um, the first question is, um, um, are theaters individually giving out um, guidelines about whether um, audience who attend are going to be spaced out or masked? And that's another thing about any audience participation. Are they going to be squeamish about participating? We don't know sort of even what the regulations are going to be in a month. I've got this one. So just to let everybody know, um, we will be dropping our audience packet, which will come out with all of the guidelines that Fringe is giving for audience members attending the Fringe. Anything before that in your rehearsals, within your um, tech process, you need to be communicating with your venue about, about what you feel most comfortable with and what your venue rules are, because those will vary between venue to venue. Um, for audiences, they will only be allowed inside of Hollywood Fringe venues or other um, like immersive performances within the Fringe Zone. So you must be live from the Hollywood Fringe Zone in order to have live audience tickets sold through the Hollywood Fringe site. We're also going to have a town hall, which I forgot to mention at the beginning of this, next Saturday from 12 to 2, where we'll be going deeply in, into all of these details with and have chance for feedback and questions and help you guys um, navigate any of these new announcements. Um, but again, that'll be dropping on Friday, which is the day that tickets go on sale. And it'll be given as, as the, t the tickets go on sale, that um, safety announcement will be um, very key. So there will be like a safety one sheet that gets emailed to everybody who's buying a ticket. Um, and those requirements will be in there as well. And then you can also always add additional requirements. If there's something that you feel most comfortable with, I really encourage you to talk to your venue about how you would like to regulate that. And it may be up to you to regulate that because it's an addition to these other safety requirements. That being said, it's totally valid to do so and your and your venues will be really grateful if you're like, hey, I have um, my cousin as a volunteer for me and will be helping make sure that people are, are, are spaced out. Or I will be placing signs and this is the groups of who I wanted to, I wanted to do my own assigned seating and I will be running it. Um, so whatever additional safety precautions that you need to take for your own health and safety and for your uh, audience's health and safety and your cast, because it's just going to be different for everyone. Some people at this point, because of the laws are so widespread and not exactly, um, it's so up to you. We have to also allow that to be up to you within the festival scope. That being said, there are some um, safety announcements coming out and there will be, um, some cohesion among the venues as well. So don't worry, it's not like it's a free for all, but I also wanted to say once those drop, you do have the opportunity to add to your page anything. And if you have those concerns now, maybe start putting that into your plan now. Will, will that town hall be uh, recorded in case I need to uh, time shift that? Absolutely, uh, yes. Okay. Of all of our um, town halls, workshops, everything will always be recorded. And if you for if you have any comments or questions, we'll always make sure to um, answer them through support um, at HollywoodFringe.org. Additionally, um, come to office hours and you can talk to me or Lois um, or Alex or Corwin. And if they don't know, if one of us doesn't know the answers, we know who does on the Fringe staff, and we can po uh, toss it over to them and make sure that you all have those answers for yourself. Uh, uh, thank you. The second thing was, it was a big disappointment to, to me and to hear for the very first time that QLab only works on a Mac. And I just Googled that and it is absolutely true. So um, it, in that case, I guess I would talk with the tech person at my theater about if I can just bring stuff and they can upload it to their QLab uh, 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 and what format I need to bring that in. I, I guess I'll be talking with them, right? There's no, do you have any other general, uh, uh, the other software you mentioned, that, that will that, would that help or save time or should I just buy a Mac? How many times would you like to do this iteration of your show? Well, I, I do. Uh, I have five performances of it, and I might like to continue, you know, uh, uh, doing it and adding to it. Well, here's the thing. Um, there's a company called Mac of All Trades that sells refurbished um, uh, computers, Mac computers. I'm going to put a link in the uh, chat. And the, to get a minimal laptop in this case i'm talking about you investing in the production of your show going forward so we would have this version of your show saved in a qlab file on this laptop so the cheapest for the 12 inches looks like about 500 dollars 
Um, there may be cheaper than that, but you'll want to make sure that it can run probably, oh, these are all 2015 though. So they should be able to run QLab for some time. Um, then you can have it as the engine running your show. And then all you need is that and whatever lights they have in the space, you can tech it wherever you go. And then you can tour with it as that as your machine. I work with a bunch of people who this is their investment in their show. And they're like, this is going to be the engine that runs my show for me for the next five to 10 years. I'm going to tour with it. it it'll be this. That said, you'll also want to make sure you get it on a flash drive in case it breaks or something happens to it so that you can have your backup. But um, if you don't want to spend that much money, and I don't blame you, and you have a laptop solu uh, solution um, that is a PC, I'm going to put another link to ShowQ Systems which is the PC version, um, you'll want to make sure that you have a chance to check in with your operator and they have a chance to run it and you'll probably need to program it in advance. But um, it should be as easy to run as QLab. I've designed a couple shows in it. Um, I think I even had it working on a Microsoft Surface one time. Yeah, it's a little chunk. <laughs> yeah, a little chunk here. And you know, even if well, what Corbin said, Ace, but even if you're not at the place where you want to or can afford to invest in a, a even a cheaper machine because money is money, um, get somebody to design your, your a QLab for you, put it on the flash drive because more venues than not, more venues than not will have a production mat in the booth. This is for, for those who don't. So then all you have to do is bring your master which not only just has the, the whole program design, you know, the stack built in, but has the master files to target because they'll put everything on there. That's the other thing. Your, your, your operator will go over that, but the master files to target. So if you don't have the money now to invest in a machine, and I'm gonna go on that because mm, that, that link, I did not know about that. I, I went on Craigslist for mine. <laughs> but, um, but if you don't have the money, then just find somebody in the participant path. There are people who can program QLab for you and sound cue systems for you and just put it on your flash drive and take it on like that and you're good to go. Thank Eric, you. Did you have one more question, Eric? Or well, I just wanted to say I worked in music licensing and I, I understand the questions people are asking about um, the music and what's so difficult, the basic difficult thing for people to understand is there's a difference between the copyright of the person who wrote the song and the person who recorded the song, that's called the master recording. And the person who wrote the song, that's called the publishing license. And if you want to get a, a license, a song for a movie, you have to get two licenses. You have to get a license for the underlying musical composition. So say yesterday by the Beatles, you have to go uh, buy the license for the underlying song. And then if you can get the recording of the Beatles doing it, but even if you sing the song yesterday, meaning you're making the master recording, you still have to pay the songwriter, whoever or whoever represents that, the publisher. So like Sin, you say you want to sing those songs by your, you know, just sing them or... Uh, 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 so that's what's so, so, but even when you go and buy royalty free, when you go on these websites and buy something that's royalty free, what that means is you do have to make an initial payment, but that's called a buyout. And then royalty free means you don't have to make any additional payments. So the buyout covers all media, meaning that you can uh, put it in synchronization, film it, broadcast it. Um, uh, the phrase is um, throughout all media now known uh, um, uh, or here and after invented throughout the universe in perpetuity. Those are the kind of phrases you're looking for, but you will have to make an initial payment even to buy that royalty free music. Now, some of these royalty free sites, at least some of the ones we're sharing, it's like a dollar or, oh. or some of them are just like credit me in your thing. Yeah, some uh, of them are um, credit commons or public domain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. cool. Yeah, that's uh, it. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Eric. Thanks, Ben. Now, uh, are there yeah. any other questions? Really quick, can you just show a show a hand raise in the video or there? I see one. Okay, great. Um, Sin, you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah. So, quick piggyback off that is the. Are images, showing images, the same category as playing music? 
the TV show, I show the iconic picture of that TV show. Same category. I'm not hearing the first part. Are you hearing uh, yeah. the first part? It's um, technically the same, unless you're. Okay. I would look into fair use and try to make sure that what you're doing fits within the fair use restriction. Because if you're using it as a commentary on it, and the whole point is commentary, that's a little bit different than if you're trying to use it for derivative work. Mm -hmm. um, fair use is fairly open and it's a little bit different than deliberately licensing things, but you have to know how your um, how your application fits into all of that. Because if you're just using people's work and it's not within any of the fair use, um, you could get into Okay, and my other question was about live streaming versus, say, a webinar on Zoom. I was just made aware that live streaming, we're using kind of this this term loosely, but it's there's really a difference between live streaming and like a Zoom webinar. And I'm just wondering, like, what platforms, what what the difference is between platforms, and why would what would be the pros to doing a, a technically a live stream versus, say, a Zoom show. Um, what sorts of uh, live stream theater have you seen that inspires you to do your show? <laughs> live stream, you have more, they're both, they're basically gradients of the same thing. A Zoom show is you're streaming, but you're trapped in the boxes, but you can do a lot of stuff in those boxes. Live streaming, I know, live streaming um, general, uh, like what Pixel Playhouse does or, did you see, I use this all the time, either The Mandalorian or the interview that um, Oprah did with Barack Obama not too long after the election. That was live streamed using OBS. He was, she was here in California. He was in Chicago. They live streamed both of them. They skinned them. So it looked like they're in the same room. The Mandalorian is using a much bigger version of that. You know, much, 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 much bigger version of that. But live streaming in one um, on the bigger on the one end means you just have more flexibility in the space. You can move the space. You can move around. You can have a bunch of multi cams. Whereas Zoom streaming, which is still streaming, which is still streaming live, you're just exporting it out to Facebook or YouTube or wherever. Um, you are just in their box in their platform. So a general live stream, the bigger one. You choose whatever platform. You can put it out through Twitch. You can put it out through StreamYard, Crowdcast, or you can just put it out through a generic one and just record it for later. But that's not live streaming, really. That's just like I'm recording it for now. So it's live streaming. It's kind of like Xerox. It's a generic. It's becoming a generic term that covers a bunch of different things. How close is that, Corin? Yeah, uh, I would also add, I'd recommend if you're, I recommend everyone take a moment or a day to go through Twitch and see what it, what's up. Just get lost, get, go to YouTube Live, get lost, um, get, look at what people are doing yeah. and look at what other people have done. Again, Bo Burnham's inside, watch it and see what it can be. Because... Pixel Playhouse and The Pack on Twitch. Mm -hmm. And The Pack is actually local. Mm -hmm. And they, they do a couple of things. They do a couple of, they do a, a video thing, but they do a late night call-in show that is like old school phone that's hysterical. But Pixel Playhouse is amazing. And actually The Pack is a great example of some, some people are not local who are doing tech. You know, there's some people who are doing tech from across the country from each other. And you can do that with something like Zoom, which could then be run through an OBS. But if you're going to do something like that, you have to be a tech wizard. You have to be very comfortable in this medium. And I would just say that if you're not very comfortable in this medium, you can definitely find someone who is. So um, build out your team that way. But, you know, we have about a month left until, until the festival. That is enough time to figure out your tech. If you have your show good, you have your cast good, and you're like, you know what, I'm going to do my tech now. Um, but it will take a, it will be a process. It is, um, techs are starting now, you know? So if this is, if this, if this was an overwhelming event for you, you're not alone. A lot of people are probably feeling that way. 
and maybe it's time to go back to your team, see what you can divvy up, um, see what you can elevate together, um, see what you need to do to make sure that you have all of your ducks in a row. And again, this is a unique fringe. If you are sitting here and you're like, I don't know if I want to, I don't know what I want to do. You're dipping your toes in right now. You're taking that plunge. This is the place for experimentation. There is no failing in fringe. There is no anything like that. There is only the chance to move into a new space with your shell um, and to have that, that experience. That being said, if you need to talk to support at hollywoodfringe.org and see if we can support at hollywoodfringe.org and see if there's uh, an alternative. If you're like, you know what, this is not, this is not for me, then that's fine. You can roll over your registration. There's a lot of different things that you can do. Um, just reach out to us and tell us about your unique situation and we'll definitely work with you. We are empathetic towards the changing nature of this year. So please um, know that. Um, and then I see a hand from Diana and then I think we've got to go right after that. So very quickly, um, I've been involved with Impro LA. We've done a lot of stuff on Twitch, a lot of web shows. Impro. So I am not technically savvy. However, I know a lot of people do OBS really well. So if you want a resource, which is not me, but I can, I can, I can only turn a computer on and off. That's how good I am. But I can um, also give you some resources. Those of you who are live streaming from other places, um, like at home or whatever, I, I can also, um, hook you up with some people to reach out to. I can't guarantee rates, but please reach out to me at my email and um, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I'll put my email in the chat again. Thank you, Diana. Thanks. And there, and also within the participant packet, some people have given their rates, some people have not. It just really depends on, on that, but uh, you can go there for a general scope about what you could expect. Um, there is time, but if you're overwhelmed, just email us and let's let's figure something out. I would just say that that is a really important step to take. Uh, I, uh, do I dropped a link in the chat to a um, piece that I made at the end of last year, um, going into this year, called uh, Unraveled, um, that was filmed using Zoom for the interaction between characters but we recorded it using OBS and then edited it together with other elements. So if you want an idea of how that can kind of look, um, that's there to have a look at. I, I spent 15 months trying all sorts of different iterations of this, whether it is a camera on a selfie stick with a really long USB cable that you run around with and it's interesting. Yeah. If there was and one just to, just oh yeah, and just to let you know, I've never live streamed anything before this year ever. And then uh, during French from home, I live streamed every single event, <laughs> uh, and I'm live streaming this one right now. Um, so letting you know that I was in the same place that you all are a year ago, and I still wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable doing an OBS, but I there are these very basic options that you can really get started with, and I think it would be really important for everybody to to do what Corwin and, and Pam especially had said that there's um there's shows out there you have to watch what you're you have to watch digital mediums in this way you have to start to find these digital shows and kind of see what works for you because it's just like theater if you have never seen a theater piece before and then you try and create a theater piece it's kind of an amazing wild roller coaster that you would try to do that and you might come up with something excellent and really exciting to watch because of it that being said, it would be really difficult and stressful for you because you'd be like, what is this? Um, and so I think you have to see what these things are. See, like if you if you're watching a Twitch, it'll, it might say like be live in the corner or StreamYard. And those are like streaming tools. And then you can go and do your own tests to do this. Lois, our operations director, and I have done about 100 fake live stream tests. I have a fake Facebook page. I have a fake YouTube page. I have a fake page for everything. And we've done hundreds of tests with all the new integrations every time there's updates. So just letting you know, it does take also not just learning at once, but relearning as updates come out. It is it is something to learn. But I 
am not what I would call a technically savvy person. I type really loud because I forget that I'm unmuted or things like that. So exactly. if, if I can if I can live stream, then you can too. And with that, I want to ask Alex to do our closing announcements. Yes, and going off that, you know, tech has been so scary for me as well. Um, so we totally understand where you're coming from. Um, but, you know, as everyone was saying, like the whole last year, um, theater sort of has developed this best practices. You know, it's sort of like the foundations of the movie industry where, you know, everyone is figuring it out as they went along and then found out best practices. So um, there's so much amazing work being made that, you know, I watch when I ever, I need inspiration on, I can't do another live stream thing. Um, anyway, uh, going off that, um, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, Pam, Corwin, Ellen, thank you so much. That was such an informative panel. I feel, I'm not even doing a show, but I feel a little bit better about um, doing one. So um, yes, next Office Hours is going to be this Wednesday um, from July, uh, from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Wednesday, July 14th. And every Wednesday from here on out, um, as Pam mentioned, it's now on Gather, which has been so cool, so fun. Diana also mentioned the Gather platform has just been so amazing. So definitely come check that out if you haven't already. Um, our next panel is going to be Tuesday, July 13th from 7 to 9 p.m. And that panel is all about accessibility at the fringe and how to make your show more accessible and what we're doing at the festival to make our festival more accessible. Um, also next Saturday is going to be our town hall. And that town hall is going to be from 12 to two also on Zoom. And that town hall is going to be all about um, it's called Welcome to Fringe. It'll Welcome overview, Fringe. yeah, it'll overview our ticketing updates, the audience services updates that we've come up with, and um, we'll also just be like, it, it is basically like all of the first part was how do you think about Fringe before you get involved, and this is now you're involved. Here's all the things that you probably forgot about. So don't worry, uh, we have that that space for you. We will talk your ear off, and then we will have a ton of space for questions and feedback as well. Um, and, and go ahead, Alex. Yeah, so sorry, if there's any other thing that you're like, ah, I'm freaking out about this, feel free to message us at support at hollywoodfringe.org and uh, someone will be right with you in 24 to 48 hours to uh, help you solve those problems, whatever they may be. Thank you all so much for coming today. I just wanted to shout out our amazing staff members that work with us and our amazing two panelists. Pam, thank you so much. Corwin, thank you so much. Alex, our events director here, thank you so much. Um, Bella, our communications director. Sina, our audience services director. And Lois, our operations director. We are a small but dedicated team and we are so excited to hop into this actual fringe, uh, like it feels like fringe again. And I'm so excited to jump into these spaces with you and to play around over the next month or two. Ah, we're here. All right, talk to y'all soon. Bye everyone.